Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, uh, I was looking for a good video that uh, would very quickly explain how uh, the United Kingdom got to the place where they have the constitutional monarchy that they have today because we've been talking a lot about that with a new king coming to the throne and talking about exactly what are his powers does he have any powers and if he does or does not when did that change how did that happen so i found this video by a channel called side quest and i'll put a link in the description so you can check out not only this video without my commentary but their entire channel haven't really dug into their channel too much but i did watch about the first minute or two of this video and it seems like it's going to do a pretty good Good job of explaining the whole situation how they got from where they used to be with an absolute monarchy or an effective absolute monarchy like they had say under Henry the eighth uh, to where they are now so let's go ahead and dive in and see what they have to say today's side quest is sponsored by our dear friends over at kingdom maker but more about them at the end for now let's think of the UK Certainly, the centerpiece in your tapestry of admirable thoughts is going to be the king or queen, roughly 10% of the time. Yet, while So that's, that's a good way to start. So 61 monarchs, we're talking about just over 40 monarchs since William the Conqueror. Uh, so the ones before that... Uh, we're really talking about England. Uh, they may even be counting some of like the, the pre-England as we know it um, monarchy. But since William the Conqueror, I believe we're like around 42, 43 now. Well, the United Kingdom remains a kingdom. And the, and the queens, I guess we're talking about, we've got Elizabeth I, Elizabeth II. We've got Mary I, Mary II. Uh, we've got Anne. And we've got, I guess the other one would be Matilda. And there you go. Even to this day, the position... Oh, what am I thinking? We're not counting Matilda. Victoria is the other one we're talking about. Okay. ...of monarch has become essentially ceremonial, with real power firmly in the grasp of Parliament. But when did this transition happen? And how did the kings let Parliament get away with it? Well, this struggle for power has been going on for quite some time, way before the United Kingdom became united. I'm not really sure it's united now. <laughs> Random Scottish guy comes in and says, I'm not really sure it's united now. So sorry about that. We need to go all the way back to the 13th century. England was its own thing back then. And like most... And hadn't been its own thing for all that long. A few hundred years at that point. Uh, and even then, kind of repeatedly... Uh, ruled by varying groups, including a couple of what we would call Danes, um, kind of descended from the Vikings. So, but by the 13th century, um, Anglo-Saxons have now been replaced by uh, the Normans, and now we are into the Plantagenets, so it's really kind of French. Most medieval kingdoms at the time, it was in a constant power struggle between the king and his vassals. Unsurprisingly, this parliamentarian mess was started by King John, famous for, among other things, almost selling England out to Islam. So, looks like they must have done a video about that, and people have asked me to cover that topic, and we will at some point. Uh, yeah, John was in a desperate situation in his barons' war, and when you're desperate, you'll do just about anything. I think he had already been excommunicated by the Pope anyway, uh, and so he did. He reached out to... Uh, one of the Muslim uh, caliphs, I believe, and basically offered to make England a vassal uh, and convert to Islam to make that happen. But um, by the time he tried to do that, he was losing his war. France had actually sent over their own king. It was the son of the French king who the English barons were going to make the king. In fact, kind of did make the king of England briefly. But then all of that was repaired by the fact that John died and his son Henry took the throne. When his barons rebelled and got him to sign the Magna Carta in 1215, Which he immediately they went demanded back on. permanent representation in a great council, which had the right to reject any new taxes proposed by the king. So uh, Magna Carta, the Great Charter, that's what it means, uh, is usually pointed to as one of the big steps forward towards constitutions and towards representative representative democracy in the West. Obviously, democracy had existed long before this. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, Magna Carta, John signs it, basically says it was under duress, immediately appeals to the Pope and, and says, I didn't really mean it, take it back. Now John tried to backtrack and wage war on the barons, but he died just a year later and his nine-year-old son, Henry III, well, he had little choice in the matter. So, pretty much since the 13th century, the kings of England had to go through this great council to raise any meaningful amounts of money. The first time the council was referred to as Parliament was in 1236, when the now grown-up Henry tried to fund his wedding to Eleanor of Provence, who was just 12 years old at the time. But that's a minor deal. Why don't you have a seat over there? We're in the middle of a... Uh, one of those documentaries on TV where they do the sting. That's awesome. Now, this original parliament only got together at the request of the king, and its members were... Parliament either... assemble, man. We're getting, like, Marvel references now. Feudal or ecclesiastical lords. However, Henry soon realized that these weren't the only people with money in England. Some among the merchants and the knights could be equally, if not more, rich. So... Now we're starting to see the basis of the House of Lords, the House of Commons, House of Lords. That is the um, the Lords Temporal, which is uh, your your high-ranking nobles who have hereditary titles, and their seat in the House of Lords is going to pass down from father to son. For example, uh, Lords Spiritual is going to be your bishops, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of York some of your you know, lower-ranking uh, bishops. Um, but then, of course, you have the House of Commons. But by commons, don't mistake that to mean the average farmer in the field, right? The commons are still the educated commons. These are lawyers and knights, like he said, and, and clerks and tradesmen. These are like your middle class. This is not the lower class. Henry started inviting such commoners in 1254, which obviously wasn't taken too well by the barons. They rose up in rebellion not long after, and... Barons like wore to electric boogaloo. That's awesome. King John, they eventually sat Henry down and had him sign the Provisions of Oxford. The commoners could stay, but the king's advisers would be elected by the barons. So it's interesting that you see that every time... You have these situations where these new roles come about, things that have existed now for centuries and centuries in England. You can see how they are born out of situations where the king has basically been brought to task and limits have been put on his power. Now, you'll often hear in the UK they refer to the Constitution. Well, they don't have a written Constitution the way the United States has a Constitution, for example, with our preamble and with our articles and with our amendments. Uh, theirs is more like just the collection of all of this stuff, right? All of these things that have happened over the years, the rules that have been made, the changes that have happened to how the government functions. They refer to all of that collectively as their constitutional law. It just it, it, it looks different than maybe to the average American we think of when we think of their constitution. They don't have like one written document kind of thing. All of this is part of that, these things that have happening. And you can see the evolution of the relationship between monarch and uh, the government and the role of parliament and the role of people and eventually way down the line you'll get people voting for parliament and all those sorts of things and crucially parliament would now meet three times per year rather than only when the king felt like it over the next century as the kings of england duked it out with france during the hundred years war they had to earn parliament's favor to secure funds for their campaigns we call this today the power of the purse, right? Okay, maybe the king has the right to decide to go to war when he wants to, and maybe parliament doesn't get a say-so in whether or not we go to war, but boy, they can get a say-so in whether or not we pay for it. So in a sense, you use the power of the purse to rein in the king. If you don't want the king to be going into war with France, don't give him the funds to make the war happen. So that's how you kind of rein in the monarch's power a little bit. And this is going to lead to disastrous consequences when the king decides he wants the money anyway. The barons were happy just to be left to their own devices, like abusing their serfs. But the commoners actually wanted to see, you know, change. 
As an act of protest in 1341, the commoners assembled in a separate building from the barons. And that's how the House of Commons was born. Before long, the commons were demanding rights like veto power over royal expenditures, the ability to draft new laws, and, uh, dare I say it, fair taxation. In 1397, King Richard II decided to punish these treasonous demands and tried to rein Parliament in, which, as always, backfired spectacularly. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? This time around, Parliament had the King deposed and gave the crown to his cousin. And in the process, laid the seeds for a hundred years of civil war. Um, yeah, well, maybe not quite a hundred years, but uh, you're going to get Henry the Fourth and Henry the Fifth, and then when Henry the Sixth comes of age and he starts losing his mind a little bit, you're going to get the Wars of the Roses, and it all goes back to Henry Bolingbroke, Henry the Fourth, deposing his cousin Richard the Second. Then, for the next two hundred years, the powers of Parliament were respected, more or less, until we get to Charles the First. True to an extent, but, you know, people like Henry VIII, for example, pretty much got Parliament to do whatever he wanted. You don't really see, during Henry VIII's reign, a lot of checks on Henry's power. Basically, if he wanted a bill passed, Parliament passed the bill. Um, you don't see a lot of kind of give and take happening until you get to Charles. He too tried to raise taxes without consent, and after a brief civil war, as you do, Parliament put him on trial for treason. The king argued that he couldn't commit treason against himself. He was the king. So yeah, I mean, up until this point, the state was the monarch. You didn't commit treason against England, against Britain. You committed treason against the king. So now, I mean, this is more than just about Charles I. This is more than just about a civil war. This is about the nature of the monarchy itself. And this is where you have really the big move toward democracy. Even though the monarchy gets restored, it gets restored in a much more limited way. After all. And that's when Parliament got the brilliant idea of separating the idea of king and country. Charles I was judged a traitor not to himself, but to England. And he was executed. Ooh. Now, at this point, Charles I is the king of both. Now, England and Wales are kind of thought of as, even though they're separate countries, they're kind of thought of as one political entity. Um, because there was really no separation of the crown like there was with Scotland. Scotland and England are both ruled by the same king, but they're separate governments, separate parliaments. Everything's independent at this point. Unfortunately, Charles's son, James II, had similar ideas about his divine right to rule. Though for him, Parliament figured out an extra spicy solution. They collaborated with his daughter Mary and her husband William, the leader of the Dutch Republic, to organize a mass... And William's also a descendant of uh, King Charles I. ...of invasion of England, the last such invasion to be successful. Parliament deposed James and gave the crown to William and Mary simultaneously in exchange for signing the Bill of Rights, which conclusively established Parliament's power over the king. Eventually, the English Parliament voted to merge with the Scottish one, Act forming the Kingdom of Great Britain. So that's why you see during, for example, the American Revolution, it's Great Britain, because that's what it was at this time. It's that whole island right here. This is the island of Great Britain. They haven't joined with Ireland to form the United Kingdom yet. That's going to happen a few decades after the Revolution. By the time you get to the War of 1812, it's the United Kingdom. And then, a hundred years later, they also added Ireland into the mix to form the United Kingdom we all know and love. Kind of, because now Ireland is not part of it, just Northern Ireland is. 
Now, while the days of absolute royal power are gone, you can still relive them thanks to our dear friends over at Kingdom Maker. So, yeah, so he's going to get into his ad now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that really sums it up pretty good. Now, obviously, that's the kind of oversimplified version of it all, but it sums it up well. Um, obviously, we're dealing with there's much more nuance to it, and, and there are further erosions of royal power, and you start to see the advent under the Hanoverian monarchs, George I, George II, George III, of the idea of a prime minister who becomes the head of government. Uh, and more and more of the power shifts from the monarchy to the prime minister. So by the time you get to Victoria, you're really kind of dealing with the modern version of what we see today. Um, kind of starts to really develop at that point so you know there's more steps involved obviously and some of you know this topic much better than i do especially some of our friends in the uk so if you've got something to add to that let's use the comment section below to continue this conversation let me know your thoughts and we will see you again very soon tomorrow morning 5 30 a.m u.s eastern time i am going to be live streaming watching uh, the state funeral for Queen Elizabeth II. I invite you, if you're up that early or if you're somewhere in other parts of the world, uh, to join me for that. We'll be watching it live together and I'll be kind of commentating as we go along. Thanks for watching.